Welcome to our special Eurovision edition of the Did You Know Community Talks. So I'll start firstly with a welcome to country. Um, firstly, the University of Southern Queensland acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways where the university is located. Further, we acknowledge the cultural diversity of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and pay respect to elders past, present and future. So the idea behind the Did You Know talks is so at the next dinner party you can go, did you know, you know, <laughs> that May is Eurovision month. So it's all about getting our experts out into the community, sharing their knowledge um, and having a bit of fun. Um, tonight's talk is with Dr Jess Carneal. So she's you know, secondary, se a senior lecturer in humanities, but firstly, our expert in all things Eurovision. <laughs> And I'm sure she'll provide you with a few of those did you know facts for your next dinner party. Um, tonight we're back here at the Alexandra Lawson Gallery, which we were here in March and we just loved it. We're in the front gallery today because in the studio gallery we're setting up for Dancing in the Dark. So there's a spot with all of your names on it. For those online, unfortunately, you can't dance with us. Some people would say that's a blessing if they had seen me dance. Um, some housekeeping for people online. Um, if you would just like to leave any comments you've got in the chat, anything you want to share with us, um, and we'll talk about it at the end. If you've got any questions you'd like to ask Jess, um, leave it in the Q&A section and we'll get back to, to that at the end. Um, so, but enough of me. Get comfortable. Hopefully at home you've got a drink and a nice comfy chair. <laughs> and welcome Jess. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming along to this. Um, hopefully you're going to nerd out with me about Eurovision. I can get very, as I call, Jess-plainy about this because this is a topic that really excites me. So, hands up if you love Eurovision. Ooh, only four hands. Why are you here? <laughs> okay. Um, the big question that we're here to answer is not, you know, do you love Eurovision, but why so many Australians do. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians watch it every year. We peaked at about 5 million back when Guy Sebastian first came on board, and that's usually across the whole week, so it's not one day, but the, th the two semi-finals and the grand finals. And we've had several hundreds of thousands watching each year uh, fairly consistently. Although now it's split between our morning show, which is when I get up because I'm a sucker, um, and also our uh, replay shows that happen on Friday and Saturday nights now to get you all amped up for the big Sunday show. Now, when I first started my research on Eurovision six, almost seven years ago, um, I was arrogant enough to think that I knew the answer about why Australians liked Eurovision. I thought, yeah, Eurovision is a European song contest. We have a lot of European migrants in Australia. It's screened on SBS. Therefore, these two things go together. Um, now, let me try something that hopefully won't backfire. So who here is either a migrant from Europe or the child of a migrant from Europe? Okay, so a handful of us, and let's keep our hands up only if we love Eurovision. <laughs> okay, this is my point exactly. So when we talk about why Australians like Eurovision, we always say, well, it's a migrant country, we have lots of European migrants. This is a story that gets repeated by us, just to quickly explain it. SBS re repeats the story, and the European Broadcasting Union, which is the, the organisation that runs Eurovision, also perpetuates this story. When Jessica Malboy went to Lisbon in 2018, there was a Senate motion to wish her luck, and amongst the reasons cited in that was that we have a lot of migrants from Europe and that this was a way of fostering an ongoing connection to Europe. But most Eurovision, uh, Eurovision fans and the Eurovision audience perhaps more broadly don't necessarily have that connection but they still enjoy watching the contest. So why is that the case? And that's what I'm going to try and help you to answer today. 
Um, but before we do that, I'm going to take you through a potted history of the song contest itself, leading you into how it came to be in Australia, and then also going through some of our representatives before we come to that final answer of why it is that we love the Eurovision Song Contest. The first Eurovision Song Contest was in 1956. So we're in the 65th edition of it now, although because we didn't have it last year, it's a little bit confusing about whether we're 65 or 66. Uh, but it was in 1956 that we had the first one. But why? Why did they decide to start this song contest? Again, we have another kind of lovely story, myth or narrative that we tell about this. And that is that it was a song contest to unite Europe. And that's a really lovely story. And it's not entirely false, but it's also not the whole story, just as having lots of European migrants in Australia doesn't tell that whole story of why Australians liked Eurovision. The reality of why they started it was that the European Broadcasting Union were launching a new television and radio network called Eurovision, the Eurovision Network. And they wanted to get more people interested in that network, keeping in mind that television was not entirely new, but not necessarily widespread. Uh, it was also a radio network, so people could get onto it that way, and that was a, a more widespread technology. But they just wanted to get more people interested in it and also to generate a sort of commercial interest for the broadcasters as well. Now, the EBU, as I'll keep on calling them from here on in instead of the European Broadcasting Union, uh, they are a non-profit organisation, but they still need to make sure that the money's coming in in order to fund the various things that they do. So the EBU actually, or the Eurovision Network, actually does a lot of the stuff that you watch and you don't really notice it. So who here watches the Olympics? The World Cup. Most news services that cover anything internationally. These are the kinds of media resources that the EBU, through their Eurovision Network, help to share. So it's actually a lot more prolific than you think. But they also wanted to generate new content that was a little bit more culturally focused. And so they had a, a whole range of things that kind of satisfied that, but they wanted something a little bit more. One of the first things that the Eurovision Network helped to facilitate was actually the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, which is fun fact because I love watching The Crown. Um, so it also, they also had a flower show, there was a papal address, uh, and then they also had a lot of sporting things like the World Cup and the Olympics. But they didn't want the network to be defined solely by that sports content. They wanted to have something else in there and something that would actually unite Europe, but not necessarily in that sentimental way, but unite them as an audience around something, uh, but give them some sort of way of investing in that, that again, wasn't necessarily being driven by things like sport. So the EBU, um, the head of the EBU at the time, Marcel Benzacon, I cannot say his name properly, but that's, that's the best that I'll do. He was the head of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation as well as the EBU itself. He had watched San Remo's song contest. Has anyone watched that at all? So San Remo is the Italian song festival and it's been going since 1951. So it is actually the longest running song contest in the world. Uh, so Marcel was a bit of a fan of that and he thought, hmm, wonder if we could adapt that for our Eurovision network and get, you know, different nations to send in a song and, you know, then we, we uh, judge those and we pick the song for Europe that year. And so that's how it started with um, plagiarising of the Italians. Uh, so it's a really kind of pragmatic reason why the song contest started, but it did fulfill that, that, that desire that they had to bring people together to watch something every year and to have some sort of cultural touchstone that all Europeans who had a television set or a radio set could share. Now the first song contest was in Lugano in Switzerland. We have this lovely image here of our first song contest winner, Liz Asia, also known as the First Lady of Eurovision. Sadly, she died uh, just a couple of years ago, 2018 actually. 
Uh, in the first song context, it was completely different to the kind of extravaganza that we know and love today. First of all, there were only seven countries that were competing. Coincidentally, they were all members of the European Coal and Steel Committee. So, you know. Um, but more countries were actually eligible to participate. The UK wasn't amongst those seven uh, because they were actually trying to launch their own national song contest that year. There is a rumour that they had been planning to be part of it, but uh, the archives of the EBU have shown that to be false. But it's still, again, another story that uh, Eurovision fans really like to tell. So we only had these seven competing nations. They all got to sing two songs each, and they were only judged by a jury. And the jury were present in the room, and there were two jury members from each of those countries, except from Luxembourg, who were participating that year. They very rarely do. Can't even remember the last time Luxembourg were present at Eurovision. But Luxembourg couldn't make it, so they said to the host, Switzerland, can you guys vote for us? The winner of the song contest was Lissacia from Switzerland. So there's a little bit of controversy, a little bit of speculation as to whether or not the Swiss jury voting on behalf of Luxembourg may have weighted the votes to in their favour. The results have never been released. They have been made public for every song contest since then, uh, which may lead you know, a little bit of credence to that, that idea that Switzerland I'm not going to say cheated, but <coughs> loaded the results. OK, so that's, that, that's the first song contest. And it just sort of sprang from there. The other interesting thing is they never actually intended the song contest to go for 65 years. There were some years where the EBU were going, should we really have it? You know, is it really necessary? But there was such support for the song contest. And a lot of nations, a lot of artists were really quite invested in it. And so it has kept on going. But uh, interest in the song contest, the success of it and its reputation has sort of gone up and down over the years. So in these early days, it was quite respectable. People would come in their evening dress to watch Eurovision. And you'll, if you've ever watched the crowd now, they're definitely not wearing evening dress. Um, so it was quite respectable. And the songs were really often nostalgic and conservative in this time. It took until uh, about 1965 before true pop music really um, made its way into the song contest. And then it had a bit of a re reputation in the 1980s of being a bit daggy and a bit outdated and behind the, the times when it came to musical taste. Um, but that's since picked up now, and even though that reputation kind of sticks around, Eurovision is great because it's one of the places where you can see the most diverse selection of music, and it can be incredibly avant-garde. Okay. So now we started with those seven competing nations. We now have over 40 nations who participate in the Eurovision Song Contest regularly. It's watched by, the numbers are between 180 to 200 million people worldwide, uh, which is more than the Super Bowl, which is at 150 million, more than the Oscars, which is not surprising because it's really quite a bit of a snooze fest now. Um, but of course, nowhere near as many as things like the Olympics and the World Cup, but it is the biggest televised cultural event, so non-sporting cultural event. So when did it come to Australia? 1983 is when it arrived on our shores here. It first began screening on SBS. It was reported on in the media, in like little tiny excerpts in the media, um, and the ABC actually has, or had, were given the first recording of the very first Eurovision Song Contest because they are a member of the European Broadcasting Union or an associate member. So they um, were, were given the rights to broadcast that. Now when the Eurovision Song Contest began in 1983, it actually only screened in Sydney and Melbourne because the SBS that we know today, that's you know, a great big national broadcaster, wasn't actually national at that point. It was only in Sydney and Melbourne where it had started mainly as a radio broadcaster. 
So when we say it's been screening in Australia since 1983, it's true, but it's a really kind of limited audience at that point. Uh, and it was a delayed broadcast, so it happened in Europe and then at 7.30 on Sunday night, it was screened here in Australia. And that was the model that we were so used to for so many years. Uh, it expanded to Canberra in 1984, so the following year, and I'm completely in love with this image that I have behind me. Um, 100 million Europeans can't possibly be wrong as they advertise the 1984 Eurovision Song Contest. And I just think it still captures so much about the Song Contest today and the way that we connect to it here in Australia. Uh, so it expanded to Canberra in 1984. Um, we didn't get it here, we didn't get SBS in Toowoomba until 1986. So it took a while for SBS to spread, therefore it took a while for Eurovision to spread, keeping in mind that we're talking, you know, pre-major internet days. So you may hear about it in your local news, uh, but you didn't necessarily get the chance to watch it. So the Song Contest wasn't a shared Australian event until the mid-1990s when SBS had spread all around Australia. And this is also the time when what the contest means and who was watching it really began to change. Because even though we often think about Eurovision, not Eurovision, SBS, as our multicultural broadcaster, in the 1990s, they were really pushing a different kind of image of themselves as well. It was sex before soccer, um, but also as the cult television network. So I spent my, or misspent my teenage years watching a lot of art house films and the cult movies um, hosted by Daz and Mangan every Friday and Saturday night. I can't remember which night it was because it was so long ago. Um, but there was, it, SBS started to get this cult following of cosmopolitan, often university educated people who like to watch something a little bit different to what was offered on the mainstream networks and also what was offered on the ABC. And so they were, were accessing a whole range of different shows. So Eurovision started to become popular amongst that kind of subset of often Generation X individuals um, who were into that kind of cult programming. And so there was a lot more um, support for Eurovision on the basis of the growth of that kind of, um, that kind of audience. The momentum for Australia's Eurovision audience, and I'll go to, to Des there now, um, the momentum for Australia's Eurovision audience grew in the early 2000s. So that's in part facilitated because of the spread of SBS, in part because you have these cosmopolitan educated people who are really into their cult programming, uh, and in part because of things like the internet. So more people were able to learn about what the song contest was. A lot of people that I, I spoke to in interviews uh, about Eurovision said it was something that they were just channel surfing and they came across this thing that had lots of bright lights and weird songs and costumes and they're like, what is this? This is the best thing ever. Uh, especially when you get to the voting, which is actually my favorite part of it. But anyway, so you've got the spread of uh, understanding of it through the internet, you've got this cult following. You also have, you do have those migrants who were watching it because it was a connection to home. And it, it does come out of the stories that there are the second generation and the third generation who were watching it, but also second generation fans. So it's just their parents liked it, whether they were from Europe or not, and they had grown up watching it, which is a lot of young people today. Also what starts to happen in the 2000s is that SPS started to invest a lot more money in its Eurovision programming. One of the first things they did was disastrous and I can't find any images of it for you, otherwise I would show you, but they decided, hey, okay, it's a European song contest, we have a lot of European migrants, we have European comedians that play upon their Europeanness. I know, we'll get Effie to host the Eurovision Song Contest in Australia. That's a great idea, right? No, it was a terrible idea. Uh, what they ended up doing was they cut out all of the introductions and everything like that, and they would show the songs 
but they would be introduced by FE and then they would have this panel of, of roughly ethnic Australians discussing things. Uh, they had an interval act by Paul Capsis, which, you know, if it was just something that was happening in a community space, would probably be a really cool thing to engage with. But on a national broadcaster, it was an absolute failure. The SBS got so many complaints about that broadcast that they didn't attempt to do anything like that again. The next time they decided to intervene, shall we say, in uh, the broadcast of Eurovision was with Des Mankins. As I said, he was the host of the cult movie show, massive Eurovision fan. He's written a book about Eurovision called This Is Sweden Calling, about his love of Eurovision and also his experience of getting to go over there. Um, when he was the commentator in 2003 and 2004. Um, now, as you may or may not know, our commentary was previously taken from the BBC. And for many years, we had Sir, the late and perhaps great uh, Sir Terry Wogan providing the commentary. So they took away that commentary and they gave it to Des Mangan. And again, there was a, a fairly ambivalent response to this. A lot of people really liked Terry Wogan and didn't necessarily like him, even though he was an absolute enthusiast. Uh, so after a couple of years of attempting that, they decided to go back to the BBC commentary until Sir Terry retired in 2008 and then SBS had to come up with a new plan. And this is where we see the rise of the wonderful Sam and Julia, and an even greater investment in the song contest from SBS, including creating all other kinds of things around the song contest, such as Destination Eurovision uh, and things like the Road to Eurovision. So all this sort of stuff surrounding it but also getting these two to commentate. Uh, and they were our commentators from 2009 through to 2006. And as you know, we now have Miff and Joel who took over for them. And there's, you know, mixed, mixed ideas about their success. I think a lot of people are warming up to them now. So it was in the time or the last couple of years of Sam and Julia's commentary that Australia began to participate. But it wasn't the first time that Australians were at Eurovision. The, uh, well, there is a myth, right? You remember I was talking earlier about the UK that was possibly going to be in the very first Eurovision Song Contest, but they weren't. Um, the, one of the rumors that was circulating was that an entertainer by the name of Shirley Abacair an Australian was going to be representing the UK at that first song contest. But obviously that did not eventuate. And again, there's nothing really to support that claim. Nonetheless, I love that story because what it means is from the very first moment, Australians were in the imaginary of Eurovision. So we're still part of the story from 1956, even if we weren't technically there. The first Australians were technically the new seekers in 1972 with Beg, Steal or Borrow, but Olivia Newton-John is perhaps more famously known for our, our 1970s representative of sorts. Um, she represented uh, the UK with the song Long Live Love. Now, does anyone else know what happened in 1974? Waterloo. Yes. <laughs> yes. So she came fourth. She actually tied fourth with two other countries um, because it was really a landslide in support of ABBA. So she didn't stand a chance. Interestingly, she performed second in the running order. And one of the big um, superstitions of the Eurovision Song Contest is being second is the death slot. Nobody has ever won the song contest if they've been second in the running order. So pay attention tomorrow and on Sunday, who is in that second slot, because they're not gonna win. And then you know what, they're probably gonna win and then prove me wrong now that I'm sharing this knowledge with you. Bloody typical. Okay, so the other connection that Australians have to Eurovision before we were officially participating is of course Johnny Logan, otherwise known as Mr Eurovision, who was born in Frankston, Victoria, um, and grew up here for three years of his life before his family moved back 
to Ireland. Now he has won the Eurovision Song Contest twice as a singer and once more as the songwriter. Um, and you will know one of his songs, which is Hold Me Now. No? Yes? Come on. Yeah. Which I didn't put on our Dancing in the Dark playlist and I probably should have now that I'm looking at that. The first application for Australia to participate actually occurred in 1970. And then again in the 1990s when the uh, Kennett government in, in Victoria wanted to put forward Victoria and Melbourne specifically as a potential host for the song contest without necessarily thinking the logistics of that one through. So we have been participating in the song contest since 2015 and it may have seemed like a kind of a weird thing but there was a bit of a run up to this. In 2013, that song contest um, featured a video, video segment about why Australians love Eurovision that SBS had put together um, with, with the help of Sam and Julia helping to explain why it is that we love Eurovision. So that's the first thing. So what's that sh what that's showing is that Australia is starting to insert itself into the production of the song contest itself. In 2014 is when Jessica Marboy was invited to perform in the second semi-final interval act at Copenhagen. Now that was the result of a lot of hard work by SBS and Blink TV, which is a production company that looks after um, our end of things for Eurovision here. What they were doing was capitalising on that pre-existing connection between Australia and Denmark, thanks to our Mary. Um, but it was also, we can also understand it as a little bit of a market experiment. How would Europeans respond to an Australian performance on the Eurovision stage? And they were largely responsive to it, largely positive. Some people actually say that her Sea of Flag song in 2014 was better than her submission in 2018, We Got Love. Uh, so that starts to, to uh, be that, that market intervention into the song contest, familiarising Australia, uh, European audiences with the idea of Australia on the Eurovision stage. So was it really too much of a surprise when the following year they announced that Australia would be coming along as a special wild card, wild card guest to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Eurovision Song Contest? And in that one, we were represented, ooh, I'll go past that. We were represented quite ably by Guy Sebastian, who came in fifth, if I recall correctly. Um, so at that time, it was seen as a novelty, uh, but it was incredibly successful as, as indicated by how well we did in the voting and how responsive people were to his performance, which was fun, it was dynamic, it was really kind of great. And so Australia was invited back the following year. What had happened in that interim is that relationships were being built. You know, there's a lot of networking that's happening behind the scenes. And in particular, Australia had fostered quite a strong relationship um, with the Swedish uh, executive, or not executive producer, uh, Swedish producer Christoph, uh, Christa Bjorkman. And so a lot of our interactions at the song contest have been facilitated by Bjorkman, who himself performed at the song contest before becoming one of its producers later in his life. So Australia was invited to return, not as a celebration thing, but as a special guest of the host nation, Sweden. So it wasn't necessarily the EBU as such inviting Australia at this point, but the host nation. And this is a heartbreaking year. Yeah. Dami was robbed. Yeah. Okay. That is the official interpretation of events. Uh, so Australia was invited to return and we put up Dami Im with Sound of Silence. Now I was conducting interviews uh, in the lead up to this song contest and Dummy's song had come out while I was, I was speaking to a lot of Eurovision fans and I would ask them, well, how do you feel about Dummy's song? And they're like, mm, don't really like it. I mean, it's okay. She's a really good vocalist and everything, but nah, I don't, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. <laughs> Our 
wrong we all were. So Dami absolutely slayed when it came to that live performance, which is unsurprising because she is a highly trained singer um, and has a degree in performance studies. So hopefully, you know, you would expect that that would have results like this. So Australia came second in 2016. What also happened in 2016 was they changed the voting system. Now, this is really frustrating. Under the old voting system, Australia would have won the song contest. So we lost the Eurovision Song Contest in 2016 because of a change in the voting system. So she was robbed. Uh, and that was also a fairly controversial year because there were um, ongoing tensions, there still are ongoing tensions between Russia and Ukraine. And when you look at that, that place board in 2016, it's quite interesting because it's Ukraine, Australia, Russia. So Australia becomes a literal buffer between those nations. In 2017, we were represented by Isaiah Firebrace, uh, who came eighth. Uh, and I'm just gonna move over to 2018 with Jessica Malboy, because I want to make a point about both of these acts. So with the song contest, there are two uh, elements to the voting. There is the professional jury and there is the public televote. The important thing to remember, and this is something that you might want to remember also with the results from Wednesday morning, the important thing to remember is the jury and the public vote on two different performances. The jury vote on what is a technical rehearsal that's done the day before the finals or semi-finals. And that's where they do a full run through of the show. The performers take it absolutely seriously because it is serious. They're being watched by the jury. There's a live audience and everything there. So it feels just like the real thing, except they don't announce any winners at the end. Uh, so what happens is you can perform really well for the jury and then flub something when it comes to the public broadcast. This is kind of what happened with Isaiah, where he absolutely nailed his jury performance. But in the public broadcast performance, he stuffed up a, a critical note. And so that's why the jury voted more highly for Firebrace than the public did. A similar thing happened with Jess Malboy. I was there. Okay, yeah. Um, I was at the jury show. I actually watched the public broadcast from a public, um, public space in Lisbon, which was fantastic because I got two totally different perspectives on the song contest. But when it came to the jury performance, she nailed it. It was amazing. And the vibe in the arena was also extraordinary. Everyone was singing along, I was singing along may have shed a tear or two because it's an incredibly emotional moment and she was just fantastic. But what happened in the public broadcast show was not necessarily that there was anything wrong with the performance, but it was this moment here, the you sing, where Jess Malboy broke the fourth wall of Eurovision. So even though it seems like it's a live performance, it's incredibly choreographed. The artists always need to know where the camera is and they're often performing to the camera because at the end of the day, it's a TV show. It's not a concert. And so this kind of behavior where you get caught up in the moment, as she seemed to do, she was so joyous in that performance, but she lost the, televise or the, the television voters in this moment. Um, people that I've spoke to that were in the arena said it was absolutely amazing. Again, everyone was singing along before she comes on. While the, the postcards are playing, lots of really cool stuff happens. Like you get to see the sets roll on and everything like that. It is the best thing ever. Um, but what was also happening when I was there, and I am assuming it would have happened the following day as well, where people were chanting her name. Like you've got a whole arena chanting your name. So there, well, it wasn't that there wasn't love for Jessica Malboy, it's just that she performed better for the jury than she did for the people and she lost that connection with the television audience. 
and that's, that's to how to understand what happened. But this is a key moment in our Eurovision experience as Australians because for the first time in the years that we had, the three, four years that we had been participating, we were on the right-hand side of the scoreboard, which is an absolute tragedy. She came 20th um, out of 26. So there was a lot of speculation about whether this was about, you know, Australia declining in favour. I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, in 2019, obviously, we were represented quite ably by Kate miller Heidke. obviously has a Toowoomba connection as her partner was from Toowoomba and is an alumni of the University of Southern Queensland. So Kate miller Heidke, again, an incredibly accomplished performer, a trained opera singer who sang her amazing song Zero Gravity from a five metre pole. Now, I can't even climb a one metre ladder let alone sit on top of a five metre pole. And it was an absolutely extraordinary uh, performance. This, however, is a really interesting one to think about when you consider the politics of the Eurovision Song Contest. As soon as Israel won in 2018, there were almost immediately calls for artists to boycott uh, the Song Contest, um, you know, sanctions against Israel. And so there was a lot of pressure that was placed on all of the artists of the song contest, Miller Heidke included, to not participate, to withdraw. Um, obviously, Australia didn't withdraw, um, and lots of wonderfully controversial things happened at the song contest, such as um, Hathori from Iceland showing the Palestinian flag. Now, the reason why that's really controversial is that the European Broadcasting Union have really strict rules about what flags can be shown, and anything that's a contested territory cannot be shown on their screens. They have special permission for um, the pride flag, the trans flag, and also indigenous flags, like the indigenous flag and Torres Strait Islander flag for Australia. Those are allowed to, to be in there, but contested territories are not. Although we could probably have a really interesting conversation about whether or not those flags for Australia also represent contested territories, and the EBU just don't quite get that yet. Okay. Um, and then, of course, this year we were represented in the second, of the first semi final by Montaigne, and unfortunately, she has not made it through to the grand final. So this is devastating, obviously. It breaks our perfect streak of qualifying for the song contest, uh, and obviously is a really sad thing to be happening on Montaigne's watch because she has not had a great run of it. She won Australia Decides last year, and then the song contest was cancelled for obvious reasons. I don't need to explain that. Uh, and then she was asked to, to represent Australia this year and came up with um, the song Technicolor. And there was some speculation about whether or not she'd be able to travel over to Rotterdam. It was, this is, I really want to emphasise this, it was the SBS delegation's decision to not travel. It wasn't the Australian government being mean and nasty and hating the arts. Yes, we do need to fund the arts, but this wasn't actually the reason why they didn't go. They had an independent risk assessment and it was decided that it would be a bad idea to go along. So they um, stayed here in Australia. Now, this year there have been all sorts of contingencies in place. Every single country recorded a live on tape backup performance, and that's the one that was uh, used for Montaigne's performance on Wednesday morning. So the interesting thing there, you remember I said the jury and the public vote. This is one of the only instances we have where the jury and the public have voted on the exact same performance. So there's no difference between the two of them. The results have not yet been released. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happened uh, in terms of the public versus jury split. So it's, I also think it's really interesting that we've got this live on tape thing because I think it opens up all sorts of opportunities for how the song contest could be in the future, uh, where there can be a lot more flexibility for the, the countries that can participate in it. We can make it more green friendly. We can also make it a lot more affordable because it, it is very expensive to participate in the song contest. And sometimes some countries don't participate because it is so expensive and they can't afford it. We've got uh, a couple of countries who, who quite consistently don't for that reason. Okay, 
So those, that's the, that potted history about Australia and Eurovision. And it's been really, really exciting to be part of the song contest in this way. But the thing is, we did love Eurovision before we were participating in it. Um, arguably, more people watch it now uh, or love it now because we are part of it. And that's sort of driven by that desire to support Australia. So there's reasons of nationalism. But why do Australians love Eurovision? So this is the base, this is the, the result of my research uh, where I conducted interviews with 106 fans of the song contest. So it is important to keep in mind these are people who identified as fans, um, even though there were some bits in their responses where they said, I'm not really a fan, but I really enjoy watching it. And there's all sorts of things to, um, to explore in that. So these are the reasons that they gave. And you can see that the number one reason why, you're, why Australians love the Eurovision Song Contest is not because we're, we've got lots of European migrants in Australia and our parents are, are migrants and everything like that, but because it's fun. And what else do we need in the world now but fun? Now, when I first got this response, I thought, oh God, what am I gonna do with this? Like fun, what does that mean? But as I kept on talking to people, I realised that that idea of fun was connected to things like friendship and community and belonging and, you know, just getting together and doing something with people who share an interest in, in things with you. So that idea of fun was actually a lot richer than I had initially thought. So never take your results on face value is the lesson that we can take from that. The second highest thing is that camp kitsch factor, um, which is one of the greatest elements of the song contest and can you can find it in so many different ways, even in some of the more serious acts. So um, I like to use France this year as a really good example of national camp because she's got that old school chanson nightclub styling in the, in the song and, the, and in her voice. And it's kind of this knowing wink at all of you going, this is what you expect a French song to sound like, and it's just absolutely fabulous. So that's one of the ways. Other ways can be like really wonderful sparkly costumes and, and things like that. The third reason is the music, and this is incredibly important because a lot of the time people go, oh, Eurovision, but the music is really crap. I just watch it for the costumes and you know, it's fine. You, know, you watch it for why you watch it. But the music is actually amazing. Yeah, okay, you get some bad songs in there every now and then, you get the novelty acts and things like that. But again, there is nothing like this in the world for you to see the diversity of artists that you can get at Eurovision. So this year we've got ethno EDM, uh, we've got uh, Russian rap, which the artist describes as art pop. We had hyper pop from Montaigne. You've got your standard um, pop bangers. You've got ballads. You've got everything in that. And there's nothing else in the world that can give you that kind of diversity and also that kind of quality. These are incredibly talented musicians and, and true artists, I believe. That's probably my bias coming through. Um, but then you can see all these other reasons like celebrating diversity, global belonging and things like that. So there are kinds of values that we associate with Eurovision that we as Australian um, hold as being important. And a lot of that is about feeling connected to the rest of the world, is about um, sharing things with other fans or other audiences. It's about um, ideas of globalisation, of cosmopolitanism, all of which do actually, in the end, come back to who we are as a multicultural nation. That multiculturalism promoted within us what we call a cosmopolitan mindset, an openness to diversity that we've since come to try and take on board as our own, just as we've tried to take the Eurovision Song Contest on board as our own. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. That was awesome. I'm so glad you've agreed. <laughs> Aren't we all? We're all We're going to look at Eurovision in a completely different way. It was a bit of a novelty, but the things that you brought in today, cultural side and the historic side, were fabulous. So thank you.
Um, just people online, if you've got any questions, please put them up and we will ask them of Jess. Um, I have, I'm going to get one in before I ask <laughs> anybody else. And it is, what is your favourite performer or moment from Eurovision? My favourite performer is Svetlana, Svetlana Lobita. Lobita from 2009. She, she represented Ukraine, who always bring it for Eurovision. And they, they are the only country that has a 100% uh, qualification streak for the grand final, which is now that we're out of the running. Um, so she represented Ukraine in 2009 with a song called uh, uh, Be My Valentine slash Anti-Crisis Girl. And that was important because she, she changed the song halfway through. <laughs> or at least that's the way, well, the way it felt. And she had these um, centurions dressed in silver around her, um, dancing and everything like that. They were fabulous. Like you have to, if you ha don't know the performance I'm talking about, Google it because it's one of the best. And there's one moment where her dancers, she's standing there, her dancers take her by the uh, waist and they flip her uh, 360 degrees around and it has been my lifelong dream to do that move. <laughs> so if you know any really burly dancers who are willing to make a sad old lady's dream come true, let me know. So it's an amazing, absolutely amazing performance. <laughs> that can help with Jess's dream, give me a ring a bit later. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions from, from our audience? Yep. yep. Sarah? No. Yep. Um, I would love to know your opinion on the supposed um, collaboration in Rome. So Ukraine and Russia are always teams that I think mm. know the other ones. Mm. Oh. Ukraine, Russia and someone. Yeah. And then um, is it Greece and Cyprus? Yes. Yeah. So we've sorry, we've just had a, a question about collaborative voting. Is that so? These, so are, these are what we call voting blocks, uh, and there's a little bit of truth to them, but they're also a little bit overstated. So in the early 2000s, I think it was, there was some overt corruption. That's the only way of putting it between a couple of the former Soviet states. I can never remember off the top of my head which states were involved in that. So they they were basically vote swapping. And what we do tend to see is it is more likely for a lot of those former Soviet states to vote for one another. It is more likely for a lot of the Scandinavian states to vote for one another. And then you've got Greece and Cyprus that always swap 12 points. Um, the thing to, to remember about that is the, the kind of popular culture in these sub-regions of Europe are often shared. Uh, so an artist that's popular in Hungary might also be quite popular in Bulgaria. Um, Russia and Ukraine are a really, really interesting one where they're obviously always at loggerheads um, politically and also culturally, but they do share pop artists and that's why uh, Ukraine withdrew from the 2019 song contest because they there was politics surrounding the artist Maruv who would have won because she's amazing um, because she had performed in Crimea and the U Ukraine not the Ukraine Ukraine have a really strict uh, piece of legislation strict policy around uh, sending artists to Eurovision if they've performed in Crimea. That was also why Russia had to withdraw in 2017, because their Russian artist had been in Crimea during the period of annexation. So, but they do, the, the public do often vote for one another because they know the artists and they know the songs. Um, so a lot of those voting blocks are more cultural than anything else. Uh, it's not some sort of concerted thing where they go, we're all gonna vote for one another because every now and then you have really quite big outliers. So I think it's, it's, over, it's there, but it's overstated, except when it comes to Greece and Cyprus who just, are, rusted on voting for each other and they do actually get booed um, when you're at at the, the contest itself and those votes are announced they get booed so, and on the broadcast yeah we just yeah hi jess great presentation thank you um quick question if the voting system hadn't have changed in 2016 and if we hadn't have been wrong mm -hmm. and um, would we have hosted Eurovision in 2017? 
So just being asked if if you can. <laughs> yeah. so, the, so the question is, if Dami was robbed, in, or if Dami hadn't been robbed in 2016, and Australia had won the Eurovision Song Contest, um, or if the voting system hadn't changed and she'd won it, would we have voted? Uh, would we have hosted the, the following year's Song Contest? Yes and no. The condition of Australia's participation in the Song Contest is that if we were to win, we have to buddy up with somebody else to co-host it in Europe. And the reason for that is time zones. We get up at five o'clock in the morning to watch that. Uh, and so if we were to have it at the time that Europeans have the song contest, so in the afternoon, it's kind of late morning or early morning, middle of the day for them. So it's just, it's kind of all over the shop. Um, so they, it, the, that is the condition that we have to, we have to host it with somebody else in Europe. Austria did always, they've put their hand up for doing that. There's a lot of push for the UK <laughs> to volunteer just so that they can, you know, have another chance at hosting <laughs> for the first time in 27, 28 years. <laughs> so, yes. What's interesting that Austria has put their hand up because it's confusing enough as it is when you go traveling. So why not confuse the matter even further? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So who's voting for Australia in Europe? We have quite a bit of support from the Scandinavian countries. Uh, Sweden in particular has been quite fond of a lot of the entries from Australia. Um, the votes from the UK and Ireland haven't been as significant as some people were expecting. Um, but then we also, we kind of get randomly popular in other pockets, but Sweden is the only one that really, really stands out there. Not that big in Eastern Europe most of the time, um, but other areas, uh, sometimes places where we've got connections, sometimes not, do also vote for Australia. So it's so sort of widespread, um, yeah. The act that comes along with the most amazing kind of new thing that no one's ever seen before in their production mm. tends to win yeah. rather than the best song. So is it the song or is it the whiz bang production? Or in the words of Salvador Sabral, is it feelings or fireworks? Mm. Um, <laughs> It really varies. Um, Sabral was a really good example of where it was the song because that is a paired back performance where you just have this very odd, awkward man singing one of the most beautiful ballads you can ever hear in your life, written by his sister who's insanely talented uh, and also a really good singer herself. So that's a really good example of where it was, it was the song that really captivated people. Uh, and oddly, you could probably argue the same with something like Toy. Not my favorite, I was a Fuego girl. Um, but in that one, people really responded to the kind of weird vocal stuff that she was doing. And as a song itself, it's, it's not that great. And they did eventually have to give Jack White from the White Stripes a writing credit on on toy because it does steal the, the beat from um, Seven Nation Army. <laughs> so there, there's some debate about whether or not they should have been stripped of their title altogether and we should have gone to Cyprus in uh, 2019, which would have been a far less politically fraught thing. Um, I, I do think it's the song that wins in the end. It is a song contest. I think that there's a lot of pressure on the participants to put on a good show. And that's an incredibly expensive thing to do. And it's interesting to think about the song versus production thing because the commentary around Montaigne's live on tape thing is that we were disadvantaged because we didn't have the pyrotechnics that the other performers had. I don't necessarily think that that's true. I thought that what they filmed was amazing 
and they did it in a small studio on a shoestring budget. Fund the arts, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying we always need to do things on the whiff and oily rag, um, but it's amazing what we can do when there's, uh, you know, little time, little money, that we, or little space that can be put into it. Um, but there have been a couple of years where it, it has been questionable about whether or not it was the whiz bangery. Um, 1944, I would cite as another example of where it was the song over the whiz bangery. Um, Heroes, however, Sweden in 2015 is, I actually think it's a fairly middle of the road song which has grown on me in the years since, especially seeing Mons perform it last year at Australia Decides, um, which was amazing. But the big thing about that is that he does that whole performance in front of the screen and it is interacting with the cartoon and people really got a kick out of that because it looks great on TV. So I think it can be a really mixed bag, but I'd, I'd like to remain a romantic and say it's the song. Any other questions, Sarah? So what is the connection for the queer community and when did it start? It's an incredibly important connection and it's not just in Australia, but when you look at Eurovision around the world, um, we start to really see it in the 1970s. Um, the coming out of Eurovision was, well, the official one that we always say is 1998 when Dana International won for Israel. Um, so she, was, she's, she is a trans woman and it was this first representation of a trans woman on the Eurovision stage. So that's the official coming out, but it was really the year before with Paul Oscar who did this incredibly licentious and camp performance that is, is really when um, you know, the, the closet doors were flung open and he was saying, I know you're out there. And I know that you know you can see me and I can see you. So it was really the 1990s where it starts to become a little bit more overt. Um, but certainly it has such a huge role um, to play for the queer community in Australia as well. A lot of the people I spoke to um, talk about it as something, especially as that queer visibility becomes more and more prominent on the stage, that it was something where they felt seen. Um, for one of my friends, actually, who I used to host um, Eurovision parties with, it was, he, was, he saw Day Night International when he was about seven or eight years old. And he just saw her and went, ah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know who I am now. And I, I want to, you know, I want to be like her on a stage and to be seen. Um, so it plays a really important role there. Um, and certainly when you look at things like Joy FM down in, in uh, Melbourne, they have their special Eurovision podcast. They always have a stand uh, and also the, um, the official fan organisation for Australia always has a stand at, at um, Pride events as well because it is a, a well-known connection and it, it's just such an important thing for that community, especially as Eurovision and the EBU continue to emphasise what they call non-political values, but they are political values of diversity, acceptance, tolerance, permitting the trans and pride flags to be flown. You know, it becomes an important touchstone for so many. Another question. How much does your mission cost and how much are the delegations required to put up? It really depends on the host country and what it is that they expect to do. Um, Sweden, for example, spent, this is for Malmo, I think it was Malmo, in 2016 spent about 12 million on hosting it and they recouped 96% of that back in tourism which is absolutely extraordinary. And this is a big reason why people like hosting it, is because you can get lots of tourists in and make money that way. Um, Lisbon, so Portugal had the least expensive Eurovision and they spent about nine million 
on it, um, about four million of which was on security. And let me tell you, they were heavily armed there. <laughs> it was a little bit disconcerting. Uh, and then you have, I think it was Russia who spent something like $56 million or something ludicrous on it. And my favorite bit, they bought out all of the LCD screens in Europe, like every single LCD screen. Like this is, I'm not actually exaggerating here, this is truth. They bought out all of the LCD screens in, in Europe in order to construct their stage. Um, in terms of how much it costs, it, we obviously have the big five. So that's the UK, Italy, Spain, Germany, and oh my God, France. Oof. It came through in the end. Um, they are the biggest contributors to the European Broadcasting Union. So they put a lot into the EBU directly, not necessarily the song contest itself. Um, so that's why they get to go straight to the grand final. Uh, and I don't actually know how much they, they put in there. there. There has been freedom of information inquiries for the UK to find out exactly how much the BBC put towards the EBU um, with some estimates of about 60 million pounds. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's just one thing I've read. Um, and each country pays, they, pay, they call it a socialist model of um, fees. So you pay according to what you can afford. So, you know, or what your GDP can afford. Um, so some countries do pay a little bit less than others. And the idea is that it kind of all evens out in the wash. Um, and sometimes other countries might subsidize, um, subsidize other countries' performances, or they do things like what Australia did originally, and they might get an industry partner in. So our first three entries into Eurovision were um, co-funded by Sony Music, which is why they were all Sony Music artists. That partnership has since dissolved, so. which is why Kate Miller Heidke had to crowdfund her um, performance. Fund the arts! <laughs> <laughs> Concern. Is that what you know? yeah. <laughs> Countries have issues with the queer content of Eurovision? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the question is whether more conservative countries have issues with um, the queer content and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, so Turkey in Turkey has not been in the song contest since 2013. And their official reasons are that um, they didn't like the Big Five model. They thought it was really unfair that those countries got to go direct to final. But they also said that the content of the show wasn't appropriate for family viewing. And even though they didn't explicitly say anything about the queer content, it was, you know, it's kind of obvious there. So that, that's one country. Um, when Conchita Verst won in 2014, there was huge uproar. It was talked about in the Russian parliament about how you know, this is a complete degradation of values and you had the leader of the Orthodox Church saying you know, this is terrible. You had men in Russia, um, this was even prior to her winning, shaving off their beards so that they wouldn't look like Conchita. Uh, so there's a huge, huge backlash against that. It's also really interesting because Russia um, hosted in 2009 and it was a huge question for a lot of the fans about whether or not they would travel into Russia because of the homo propaganda laws. Um, with some people choosing not to and others choosing to do so but being incredibly cautious about how they behave. Graham Norton um, quite famously made comments about not necessarily feeling safe as a gay man having to travel into Russia to do his job. Now the irony about that is that in 2008 the act that won for Russia was Dima Balan with a song called Believe which featured him in white of course because what else are you going to wear to Eurovision? Shirt open um, with a virtuoso violinist who was male and Plushenko, the um, famous ice skater, also male, sort of like playing the violin and, and the ice skating all around them. And there's all sorts of 
things that they do where it makes it look like their eyes are meeting but they're not quite and and it's it's one of the most homoerotic performances you'll ever see in your life and there's some commentary around that that says that even though Russia didn't approve or doesn't approve of that kind of queer content that performance illustrates how they were willing to play with it in order to attract those votes so yeah the pink vote as it's called we have time for one more question tonight Absolutely. Yeah. So the question is about whether or not restraining the extravagance of the event could make it more inclusive. And I would, I would say absolutely um, that that is one way of, of doing it. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's a big part of the event itself and it's kind of like putting on a good face for the rest of Europe that you need to make sure that you, once you can afford to participate, that you're putting on a good show. Um, and that, that shows that you're doing well as a nation or that you really want to win it. So it is an investment for those countries to put forward a solid performance and a solid production um, in the hopes of winning. It's an investment that can fail. But that is a big reason of why I think the live on tape thing could be quite an exciting um, development to be a, an ongoing part of the song contest because those live on tape performances are a little bit more pared back. They've got less time to, to do it and everything like that. But it could be a way of, of cutting back on travel costs because the delegations are over in the host country for sometimes up to a month, but usually at least two to three weeks. And they've got to pay for their own accommodation. They've got to pay for their flights. They've got to pay for putting on the show itself, uh, those sorts of things. So it could cut back on some of those costs and, and make it more affordable, therefore more inclusive for other nations. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jess. That was fabulous. Um, so this has all been recorded for people who couldn't make it tonight. Um, we'll see you later. Um, we do, Jess has kindly put together a Eurovision playlist for our Dancing in the Dark a bit later. So um, I'm hoping you can all join us. Thank you so much, Jess. That was just fabulous. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Next month, we our Did You Know talk is on um, hypersonics and rockets and you'll have an opportunity to go and hang out in our hypersonic lab with our um, amazing experts that work with NASA and all that sort of stuff so you're very welcome to come along so that's the third Thursday of June I do not know what that day is but um, have a look in your calendar once again, thanks so much, Jess. You've given me a completely different view of Eurovision and I will be taking this week off work next year too. <laughs>